things get on camera. <laughs> my first thing I ever made was this teeny tiny quilt made of little squares of felt. And I still have that. And I was always pretty obsessed with miniatures and um, dolls and whatnot, but I never played with them like normal dolls. I would go set up like these forts in the woods and um, let them live in there and then go out like months later and see, you know, how the mud had changed everything. And it's that classic thing, like when you leave, what do your dolls do and what do your toys do? The whole fascination with inanimate objects and what they say about culture and the design of different dolls and toys and how they're played with and what they represent a sort of um, gelling of an imagination and an object creating, equaling a whole other world is just endlessly fascinating to me. In college I started working more in graphic design and in advertising. I was still working in advertising when I met Larry, my husband. He was doing film and I was curious about that. I left advertising to work in theater and then I started doing uh, props and sets. Then it was just a tiny skip from there to Larry was making a movie and I said, well, let me make some stuff for it. Who are you? Mr. Dancer, who are you? I'm God. I'm number one in the God Squad. All of Venus was a project Larry was working on. It was a, a woman we knew um, in the community. She was an incredibly talented performance artist and writer and also a go-go dancer. So she did a piece that was very much kind of um, self-referential memoir piece about being young in New York, being a go-go dancer and the people she met. One of the characters she met was a guy who was a performance artist. He had all these props and things that he made for his performances that they used in the movie, so I made them all. Heather lived in a, an amazing loft and my approach with art direction and continued to be that way, as much for budget as for philosophy, has been to find really amazing locations and then just kind of groom them a little bit, accentuating what's already there. I don't really know how we started co-writing, except that we bounced a lot of ideas back and forth. I think we just, at that time, had become um, on our own sort of enamored of like animal rights movement. And, but we researched a lot and we thought this would be an interesting structure to impose on the Frankenstein mythology. Our influences were very much like Andrew Wyeth paintings and that color, the color scheme, that sort of ochre and that kind of blue. And his world was very much about metal and cages. Hers was all these luscious colors and painting and she was often more, her backdrop was more nature. The second habit that he did, we really worked on that story a lot together. All the night stuff in New York City and Nelson Bakerman photography and all that kind of romancing of New York was a lot of our work. I found it at a certain point I became very interested in doing other things and I did this children's newspaper and then I designed software for um, Scholastic. Started to do animation on my own. Then when I Sell the Dead came into the Glass Eye Picks thing and I read that script, I just really saw it in my mind so clearly. That particular script I was very in sync with um, Glenn's vision and the look of movies that he liked. In Staten Island, which is an incredible place, we found this fort where we could like step back in time if you kind of just looked this way. So we had this big crowd scene with the guillotine and whatever, and I think they were happy like I got some baskets and some tables and they were just, they were gonna like kind of shoot and make it look like it was much more crowded. And then I'm like, I know some people who have goats. We brought in animals and mud and a lot of extras. Those are always like fun scenes when you look at that and you're like, damn, we really did that for nothing and it looks just as good as some other thing. You know? We'd have to shoot the scientist lab and then run over here and like throw up a bed and some drapes, turn that same wall into a bedroom. That one has a lot of favorite sets and I love shooting on the beach. I think I Sell the Dead and Stakeland are two movies that I worked on that the production values far exceed the budget. Right, so Bitter Feast was, um, I had met Joe. He's a really great guy. He was so, like you would do something here, you're just like, oh my God, that's amazing. How did you get that tablecloth to fit that table? That's incredible. You know, like he made everything you did like seem like this incredible thing. You know? Joe didn't really come from this genre of horror and I liked the way he had a movie that was very grounded in another kind of pacing but had these kind of horror beats and tropes. So I'd never done anything that was so much about food styling, except when I was in advertising. So that was really fun, like kind of throwing myself into gourmet magazine style, like food setups. In Stakeland, I must have literally emptied this barn out 
and put filled trucks with all my stuff and took it to those locations on sets because we just needed things, you know? <laughs> second unit, the part that I uh, was art directing, was up here. Brent Kunkel, who also worked on I Sell the Dead, he's a producer who, you know, loves to scout also, who really, like, understands that production value can come from getting a location that really brings it. There was a scene when they, ha they came upon a town that was populated and it was like there was a band playing and when you sit back and look at those scenes, I always think it must be like being at your son's wedding or something where I look and I'm like, oh my God, like that came from this guy who I met, you know, at this party and that guy drove into his driveway and said, can we borrow your truck for a day? And this guy said, I got a deer and something in the back and it becomes this like hootenanny. It's like it takes a village. So those scenes are always feel very accomplished. The first half they shot where Jim grew up. So he also had entree down there to see where, you know, cool places were. And then we came up here. There was a, a scene towards the end when they tied up this girl. And Michael Cerverus was coming. It was all very dramatic. And we shot in this place. It was pretty dilapidating, quite beautiful. There was a ton of wood everywhere. And we came up with this motif where the wood was just sort of radiating out. It kind of added another layer to what could have just looked like a place that was filled with junk. We made the wood sort of have a almost like an illustrated character of like mm, moving you into the frame. Nick Dimici, the main character, he is also like an art department's dream where he just made so many incredible props. He had made his costumes. When you've got someone like that on the team, you rise to the challenge to make sure that you're as vested in what you're doing. Look, Cider, I got a new book. It's creepy and it's scary. So I took a class at SVA and I learned from this old school guy and learned stop motion and I did, made a movie called That Creepy Old Doll. And that got into a bunch of festivals, which was cool. But then I had my son right after that. And I kind of took a little step back to, you know, be with him. I was still designing software at Scholastic. And then I just, yeah, I just slowly started getting back into it. I had this idea for advent calendars. And I said, why don't we do one that's creepy Christmas and it could be the 25 days of Christmas. And then from that, I did a film festival where I was like, wouldn't it be cool if it was like an advent calendar style film festival? By this time, I'd met a lot of filmmakers, a lot of different artisans. And I invited 24 of them, including myself, to make a short and I gave them the props from that particular window. They all made shorts and it was great. I had people that were filmmakers with a capital F and then people that I knew that were just curious people and strange people and, and I got an incredible array of movies. From that I had a big party. At that party I met a young um, musician named Elizabeth Zyman. I'm just so perfectly perfect except when I'm not I'm she is an incredible musician and I called her and I said if you ever think about doing a video I'd love to do a stop motion and we met and really hit it off it was perfect for me literally perfectly perfect a little ghost girl with shadows under her eyes. that was a song that I heard my friend play and immediately had like a impression and at the same time my friend announced that she was going to tear down her house. I said, oh my god, I just totally have to shoot in your house. I love the eeriness of working with people, but kind of playing with time and scale and motion. Animation can be very precious, you know, controlled lighting and miniatures, but the principles of animation, I love when that's juxtaposed on like a bigger thing. We just picked one day, it was myself, Chris scotch Depole, and Colin O'Brien. We had sledgehammers, and so we just went in, slammed, came out, took the picture, went in, slammed, and we just did that until we were almost like mesmerized. I think she was a little shocked when she saw what we did. I had done a project for Glass Eye for a movie called American Jesus, and I think they liked what I did for that. We want to do a new teaser. We have this cool logo. We have this idea that there's all these characters, kind of like gremlins. Basically what they're doing is putting the logo together. And I was like, 
That's totally up my alley. Let me do that. I'm always asking him, do we write this off? Because this house is like always a set. Everyone's like, can I shoot this up there? You know, can I shoot in your barn? Can I borrow this? Can I borrow that? And you know, we, we like to encourage that back and forth. I think Glass Eye definitely responds to directors who are very hands-on, who, you know, have either been behind the camera or, you know, worked in the art department, and they're kind of wear many hats. So I would say that's kind of a Glass Eye earmark is people who kind of, you know, they're not gonna wait around until they, till the people arrive to help them. They're gonna start it, and then Glass Eye can help sort of fan those flames, you know? <laughs> <laughs>